Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tents, which is a collaboration between Slate Magazine, New America, the think tank, and Arizona State University, where I also teach in our Cronkite School of Journalism. And uh, as Angela mentioned, as we were getting started, this is part of a series that we're doing. Uh, it's called Social Distancing Socials, where we're trying to uh, engage with with followers and folks more rather than less in this time of uh, when we're all on uh, virtual house arrest um, because the issue of how technology is uh, impacting society in our lives um, is never been more uh, acute or relevant and interesting and speaking of so when it comes to interesting i have to say today's social uh, is very indulgent on my part because i'm using work as an excuse to bring together two of my favorite people and some of the more interesting thinkers I know, um, and then being able to share it with, with our audience. So it does feel very indulgent, particularly since I know the two of you are also incredibly busy. But if I threw a dinner party, you probably wouldn't come, but I'm so glad to have this work excuse <laughs> to talk to you guys. Um, so uh, first I wanna introduce, um, I don't know if he's to your left or to your right, depending on your screen, but uh, in the sort of orange um, top is Leon Krause, who is uh, so many things. I mean, I, I think I could spend one hour just, we would, we would burn up the hour talking about all the various things you do. I feel like there are like a dozen Leon Krauses roaming around, the, you know, roaming the earth because you do so many things. <laughs> but Leon, for those of you who don't know, um, has done a lot of podcasts with Slate writes a column for Slate, also writes a column for the Washington Post, uh, but we won't mention that. He is, uh, one of the Leon Krauses is also the news anchor of KMAX, which is like the, one of the coolest call uh, station signals or whatever you, you call those things for the Univision broadcast in Los Angeles, um, which has to be, I think, one of the most watched uh, local newscasts anywhere in the world, or at least it was before Leon showed up. I don't know if it still is, but <laughs> Leon also was a very well-known, um, great uh, radio personality in Mexico before he picked up and, and moved to LA um, a while back. And just, uh, just there's a very serious Leon Krause out in the world who also writes about the history of soccer. So that's, uh, that's so many Leon Krauses. Anyways, thank you so much for being here, Leon, with us. Thank you, and Andres. Uh, and then we have Charles Kenny. Charles is, uh, uh, I should look at your formal title before starting to just describe you randomly. You're the Senior Fellow and Director of Technology and Development at the Center for Global Development. Um, I first became a Charles Kenny fanboy when I read an article you wrote, uh, I believe it was in Foreign Policy back in the day, talking about the power of television to be a messenger for pub public health improvements and awareness and the messaging that would go into uh, soap operas in Brazil and India, I think it was, in terms of public health messaging, which, which seems very relevant to today's conversation. And then as a result of that um, and other engagements that we had, you, you were a fellow at New America and now you're at the Center of Global Development. I think, I think your fellowship in New America was one way to rescue you from a thriving, successful career at the World Bank. Um, but one of the things that's very um, uh, popular these days are these apps that calm people. You know, they're meditation apps. And if you have trouble sleeping in times of anxiety, you, you can download these apps. I would suggest that instead of downloading one of those apps, if you ever feel anxious about the state of the world, just call Charles Kenny and he will soothe you and put you at ease. <laughs> and so at the, this, at the end of this broadcast, we will share with folks um, Charles' cell phone number so that you can do that. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter what time zone you're in, just, just call Charles. Uh, Charles wrote, um, has written several books. Uh, one of the books that he wrote that's very apropos of the conversation today, the title was Getting Better, Why Global Development is Succeeding and How We Can Improve the World Even More. Uh, most recently, you wrote Close the Pentagon, Rethinking National national security for a positive some world. But I want to start the conversation, Charles, um, 
help us set the scene. We're supposed to be talking about, you know, how humans have never had it this good. And can we still say that? And, um, you know, those of us who are fortunate to be able to work from home are kind of on lockdown. So um, doesn't seem like the best of times, um, but, but kind of remind us why, when you think of global development and the sort of grand sweep of history, which is, which is how you tend to think of things. And, and one of the reasons I admire your work so much, um, kind of remind us why we have it so good right now. So I used to uh, write uh, piece pretty much every year, uh, sometime between Thanksgiving and New Year's, uh, saying uh, this is the best year ever. And I could keep on writing the piece because it kept on being true. Um, if you look at global poverty, uh, the proportion of the world who lives on less than a dollar ninety a day, which is a kind of the, the World Bank standard for absolute extreme extreme poverty, used to be most of the world, and now it's it's or at least last year it was below ten percent. Uh, if you look at uh, infant mortality, child mortality, it's been dropping, dropped by about two thirds just between nineteen ninety and twenty fifteen. You look at the levels of violence worldwide, they've been dropping over until recently, the, the, the uh, number of people living under a democracy was going up, sort of choose your measure, and it was, was heading in the right direction. I should say, though, that um, in the last few years, I've stopped writing uh, that <laughs> yearly column um, on, on how this is the best year ever. Um, predating COVID, um, frankly, we'd seen at least a flatlining and, and some reversal in global trends towards democracy. Um, and this year, sadly, I think it is very clear we're going to see reversals in probably in global life expectancy, certainty, certainly in, in, in global poverty. So um, maybe you don't want to call me up for uh, soothing advice anymore. I would say, though, still that um, this pandemic is 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 already has affected so many lives in, in, in so so many terrible ways, um, and we haven't responded to it nearly as well as we should have done. I'd still say we're responding to this pandemic better than we have in the past to previous pandemics. So, you know, even sort of in the bad times, we're doing a bit better than we used to uh, when it comes to uh, uh, responding and trying to limit. The, the harm and the suffering worldwide. So a lot of the progress in, in recent years, and I'm thinking about maybe the, the, the run up to the UN development millennial goals that were established at one point that we were, countries were supposed to hit in 2015. And I can recall a few years back talking to you about those and those were certain measures and, and, and objectives about the eradication of extreme poverty or its reduction and, and so forth. And some of the, the, the uh, indices that you were talking about, um, which, I, and I hear you that recently they had been starting to plateau. So maybe uh, sort of the, that sort of triumphal sentiment needs to be tempered. Uh, but there was a lot of debate around the fact that, um, you know, for better or for worse, the, the progress that, we're, we're, that we were seeing, and perhaps it's somewhat uneven distribution was attributable to globalization, right? This, this amorphous term that we often throw out there, globalization, we kind of all have a sense of what it means, um, uh, but maybe we don't quite define it as precisely as we should sometimes. But I wanna like pivot to Leon uh, and, 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 and ask you to think, to reflect on, on the state of globalization today. You are kind of one of the, you have a front row seat and you're a chronicler of Los Angeles, which is this teeming, amazing kind of daily symphony of all the things that we think of when, when it comes to globalization, whether it's the Cambodian donut shops or the, you know, all the places you can get mole from Oaxaca, the thriving port of LA and Long Beach that, that, that funnels through so much of the trade for the entire country you know, the daily, the, the nightly flow of all those flights going off to Europe, well, up until recently, and, and Asia, and LA as sort of this amazing uh, metropolis that in some ways is like the second most important Mexican city, arguably, and the yeah. Persian city, and, and Salvadoran city, and Salvadoran city. And so, you know, you're living this, this kind of chaotic 
wonderful, somewhat, sometimes horrible, you know, whatever you want to, adjective you want to use, you're living and chronicling, and you did it with, the, with that great book, La Mesa, where you talked about the, the Latino, you know, immigrant experience in, in LA. Um, so when you think of this moment that this pandemic coming in the aftermath of a political rethink of globalization in some places, do you think that we're in for a, uh, a regression, a retreat from globalization, or are we going to kind of come back to the side and think, you know what, we're more inter interdependent than ever before, and five, ten years from now, are we going to see more coordinated responses to our economic life and responses to crises like this? I mean, it's a big question, but I'm eager to hear from you on that. Well, uh, Andres, uh, for, first of all, uh, uh, allow me to uh, apologize for my dogs <laughs> who uh, are, are pretty noisy. They, they, they have stopped already, so I, I think we should be good. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a good description of Los Angeles, what you, what you just uh, shared with, with us. Uh, it, it truly is a fascinating place. Uh, uh, for me, the, 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 the capital of Latin America in the United States, with all due respect to my friends in, in, uh, in Miami, and um, the experience of living here has been uh, a fascinating one, for sure. Uh, I, I would begin by saying that it's, it's hard to argue that, uh, that we have never had it this good when, when 16 million Americans, we, we just learned recently, are applying for unemployment benefits. And, um, but I'm an optimist. I, I agree with Charles that the overall trends uh, don't lie and that humankind is, is uh, still heading in the right direction. But there are questions that uh, that should 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 linger and, and should occupy our attention, and, and one of them is uh, is immigration. Um, you 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 mentioned the work I've, I've done in Los Angeles with a, with a, the large immigrant community here with La Mesa with this experiment of uh, community oriented journalism, and uh, I've 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 recently been been writing about how the United States has uh, been responding to. To, uh, to the to the immigrant communities hour of need in this crisis uh, as we know there are uh, 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States uh, they pay over uh, 11 billion dollars in taxes uh, every year as well and yet the government's uh, historic uh, unprecedented uh, stimulus package simply uh, ignored them uh, did right. not provide one cent of aid for them. Uh, it, it provided support for, for Uber drivers, which is a great thing uh, for the first time, but for the undocumented workers that, uh, for example, make up 40% uh, of the country's um, agricultural industry, nothing, zero, not one cent. And I think that this presents a, a real uh, dilemma uh, that goes to the heart of your question about globalization. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a moral and economic dilemma, at least for the United States. Um, I, I do think that it's interesting that the government has uh, recognized the work of these people as essential during the emergency, or, uh, or at least of, of those people who work in the, in the fields and, and the food processing industry, because they are essential. Uh, ideally, for me, the pandemic should help us uh, realize just how essential the work and presence of immigrants in, in a society like ours really is. Uh, the idea that, that immigrants are unnecessary is, is, is a travesty, it's a fantasy. But the question remains, uh, will this realization lead to a more sensible approach to immigration or to a nativist backlash? Uh, I, I, I have been interviewing a couple of people um, recently for, for, for a column I'm writing, and uh, one of them is uh, the, the head of the, 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 uh, the main association of Mexican entrepreneurs in Los Angeles, and he told me that, of course, he's worried about unemployment, he's worried about the current situation um, in the short term, but mostly, he says, what concerns him the most is uh, that this will trigger uh, a larger nativist backlash that will strengthen the populist position that Trump uh, came to power uh, on, and uh, and and we will we will enter a, a new a new phase of uh, protectionism, of barriers, of borders, and uh, and uh, prejudice. And I think that uh, the the question is is right there uh, in the air. I don't think we we have a clear answer to that. Still, I'm an optimist, but the question is is, is lingering there. 
Yeah, it's an it, it it's it's. I like the way you talk about how you know there's the present crisis, and and you mentioned you referenced the incredible unemployment claim numbers, and 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 part of what uh, I think we're starting to tr you know begin to wrestle with uh, is the current emergency, and then also what will be, as you put it, the lingering questions and and the aftermath. And um, I think the immigration piece of this is really important. Um, you know, it, it, it's also not, not only do those workers pay all that in taxes, they're also sending home to Mexico close to $40 billion in remittances, uh, which is important for the development of North America as a whole. And um, the other thing that I, you know, I, I, I think we, we probably all, all of us have been thinking about this, the, the fact that in previous times of national crises and mobilization, and we think back to, you know, the U.S. going to war in World War II and thinking of the greatest generation. And I wrote a column about the about the fact that, like, when we think of, of the band of brothers that got us through that crisis, yeah. you know, you picture the, the soldiers in their GI uniforms. The, and now, you know, as you referenced, the, we're, we're relying now on, you know, essential workers who are kind of like the frontline heroes of this battle, if you want to call it a battle. And, you know, obviously a lot of those folks are the healthcare providers uh, and medical professionals. But we also were having to realize that the, the person, you know, uh, shelving the, you know, putting the food on the on the shelves in the grocery store, uh, the farm worker who is, you know, uh, picking those crops and, and the people out uh, out and about cleaning the transit workers in New York City, my gosh, I mean, and all of these communities are, you know, people who have been um, maybe taken for granted, if you want to put it charitably, if not exploited, if not underpaid, you know, and, and uh, the reliance that we as a society have on on that part of the population that where, where immigrants are disproportionately represented. I'm also, it reminds me a little bit of the aftermath of 9-11 in New York, where there were official figures of casualties, and then there was a time lag, and the numbers would, would take a while to catch up because you had to add people who who you know were delivering the food in the twin towers and and some of the staff that maybe was not officially registered and you know it just kind of it was this interesting moment where we were reminded of the fact that our economy and our society somewhat hypocritically like relies to its benefit on people that are operating in the shadows um so charles i know that mig migration is one of your you know core subjects in terms of thinking about uh how it affects and impacts global development. And it's something that you guys at, at the Center for Global Development have done a lot of work on. Um, so to this lingering question that Leon has has posited, do you worry that we're gonna see this this retrenchment in, 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 in terms of migration flows that might be prejudicial to global development? Again, uh, understanding that this is this pandemic isn't coming out of the blue. I mean, it it is happening on its own uh, for its own reasons, but it's happening against a backdrop where the politics were already rethinking this, you know, push towards greater global interdependence and integration. So, um, you were asking, you know, we, 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 you were saying we sort of throw around the term globalization without thinking really, you know, what's in it. I think one of the most important parts of globalization is the movement of ideas, and ideas move most easily uh, when people move with them. And I, I think it is just undoubtable, that, uh, unquestionable that, that one of the, the greatest force behind sort of global progress is people moving around the, uh, around the world sharing ideas. And if you look at Silicon Valley and the huge proportion of you know, startups there that are founded by immigrants, um, you know, that's just one example. You were talking about the uh, uncounted at the, at the the bottom uh, uh, of society, and I think you know, we down when we talk about Silicon Valley, we we sort of forget about the vital role that they play too. I and mean, at the moment, um, across the Midwest, you're seeing farmers, you know, screaming, saying they can't get enough people to bring the crops in from the fields. Uh, so I think you're you're absolutely right about that. As to where we go in the future, I think they're going to be there's sort of two competing things going on right now in a long term trend that I, I hope pushes us back towards realizing quite how valuable migration
recognition is selfishly forget forget its impact on global development just for us in the short term you've got the fact that anybody wandering into a hospital realizes how important migrants are to the well-being uh, of people in the United States. You know, a, a goodly percentage of everybody you're gonna meet in that hospital who's getting, getting you healthier uh, are, are migrants. On the other hand, you do have uh, what is a kind of um, uh, biological uh, uh, urge amongst people who face infection to get less friendly towards the other uh, to, towards other people i mean this isn't this isn't just humans um you know uh, animals who 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 uh, face lots of infection tend to be uh, much less friendly towards outsiders to people they don't know uh, it's something that uh, we have inherited biologically and so it's quite easy to make somebody um express more anti-immigrant views sadly uh just by showing them pictures of people with measles um, uh, if you if you do that randomly amongst a sample of people, uh, the, the people you've shown pictures of measles to will come out with more uh, anti-immigrant attitudes. So there's sort of these two competing forces. One is our base instincts, if you will, to to think about infection as being a problem uh, of the outsider, and that makes us uh, more anti-immigrant. On the other hand. You know the fact of the matter that uh, the people who are helping us right now, who are uh, are, are making this situation um, more bearable than it would otherwise be, are migrants. In the longer term, my ex expectation is that we will move towards um, a, a great to understanding and appreciation of uh, um, uh, immigrants in this country purely on self-interest, um, and that's because uh, we're going to get older and we're going to want to retire. And if you look at the future of the United States, um, less so than other countries, but still true in the United States, um, we're seeing an aging population and we're going to want somebody else to do the work when we're 80. Um, and I think this is going to be a global phenomenon. And actually, my guess is in 20 or 30 years, we'll be talking about my, a migration crisis and the migration crisis will be there aren't enough migrants. Mm -hmm. We're going to see um, an increasing global competition for the migrants that are available um, you know as I say other countries have it much worse than the United States partially because they have lower uh, immigrant populations already um, Japan at the moment has gone from being a country that basically tried to keep out all migrants to being one that's desperately searching for more people to come in and work in the country China is aging as fast as Europe is China and Europe are both gonna um, find themselves in a similar position uh, lots of people who don't want to work who want to retire who want to move on and not very many people to fill the jobs and so my guess is that in, in 30 or 40 years we're going to see the sea change and evidence is already there that it's happening if you look at the younger people in uh, Europe in the United States they're already much more pro-immigration and it's because they realize that they're going to be left carrying the can of the economy if you will uh, uh, as as older people retire and I so I'm I'm optimistic in the long term that we'll see uh, a reversal of this recent nativism. I admit in the short term, you know, how, how these two different forces play out between a, a surely a greater understanding of the role that migrants are playing in our society against our sort of base instinct to associate uh, the threat of infection with the threat of the other, I don't know. Hmm. So we, we thought it might be fun to throw this question to uh, those of you uh, following at home, because I guess we're all at home, but um, to our audience. Uh, we're gonna ask this poll question, long-term will COVID-19 accelerate or reverse globalization? I know there's there's always some danger in these binary questions, but uh, taking advantage of the uh, poll functionality here uh, <clears throat> the, of Zoom, we thought it'd be fun to sort of just get a rough sense of, of where you all are, because I, I think it is an interesting question that, that could go either way. And in the meantime, you know, Leon, since, since this conversation is, is uh, in terms of the fate of humans and the human race is global by nature, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you see the sort of cross border relationship with Mexico and how this pandemic is playing out in countries like Mexico, because one, I think one of the, one of the universal political trends of late has been um, a bit of a second guessing of technical technocrats everywhere, you know, part of the populist wave has been sort of a, a revolt against the kind of ex expert technocratic class that advanced globalization that was 
part of this neoliberal, you know, project as, as people are fond of now critiquing it. And obviously we have a populist government in Mexico that is similar in some ways, very different in some ways from the administration in Washington and has had its own, shall we say, idiosyncratic response to the uh, pandemic in Mexico. And so, and, and, you know, this is playing out in a lot of different countries where this flavor of politics um, has taken hold. And, you know, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about how you see things um, in terms of the, the cross-border dynamic and what's happening in Mexico and what that suggests for years to come. Well, it's a it's a it's a big question. I, I would begin by saying that uh, I think that one of the there are a few there are a few silver linings to this uh, horrendous crisis, this emergency that we've uh, that we faced in in 2020. One of them is I would I would argue the the resurgence of of experts in the the public sphere, uh, Andres, uh, in Mexico. Uh, uh, an epidemiologist is now uh, commanding the stage, not the president, although he, he has uh, his daily uh, press conferences every morning. Uh, if, if people in the United States think that um, uh, President Trump's uh, daily press conferences in the afternoon are an, a, 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 perfect, a perfectly choreographed act, um, act of propaganda. They should tune in to Mexico's uh, a morning press conference to, to, to learn from the best. Um, but in Mexico, just like in the United States, we have a scientist in charge. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking... I'm talking about epidemiologist Hugo lopez Gatel, just like Anthony Fauci, in uh, in uh, in America. Now, now, having said this, uh, let me let me uh, mention another one of the silver linings that I that I uh, that, that I think is is, is uh, interesting, uh, which is that propaganda for me, uh, uh, most propaganda has become almost useless politically. I mean, it is more difficult to spin narrative when we are not talking about. Uh, more abstract concepts like uh, like immigration, rather than the immediate terrible reality of, of people of people dying. And I mean, this means that governments will be certainly judged. I would imagine uh, solely on their on their competence rather than on their uh, ability to present alternative facts through their usual propaganda channels. And we see this in in uh, in Mexico. We see this in Brazil, and we see this. Mm -hmm. Uh, across the world in, in populist uh, populist governments, uh, in other words, I mean, not even Fox News can can spin can counter the reality of thousands of Americans dying so dying of of this disease, uh, and I think that's that that is a silver lining in in a way. Reality, history, uh, if you want to get a bit more metaphysical, even nature itself is calling populism's bluff. Uh, now they have to answer the question: Can you govern? Can you deliver on your lofty promises? And as of now, a number of those governments uh, have failed to live up to their promise of good governance. Trump, of course, but also uh, Jair Bolsonaro and, frankly, Lopez Obrador in Mexico. Um, and I think that we can we can at least hope that, that people in the U.S. and Brazil and Mexico and other places will not forget or forgive this this particular particular failure that will certainly have an effect in uh, not only the life of each country, but of course the relationship between both countries, uh, thinking about Mexico and the United States. I, I, I love how you put it, calling uh, nature's bluff. Um, and also uh, our polling question, it's 46% of respondents feel that um, this crisis will accelerate globalization, 54% that it'll reverse. So uh, <clears throat> I think that is another indication that that these lingering questions are, are close calls and, and interesting. Are we thinking um, in the short term or in the long term, though? Well, that's in the short term. If, you know, I, I guess I would probably say it's it's hitting a pause, right? But but yes, that was a, a little bit ambiguous and left up to people's interpretation. Um, but if you have questions, you can you can submit them through the Q and A on the bottom of your screen. Um, there was a question here about. Um, whether we feel that the, the COVID-19 crisis might lead to some breakthroughs in science and technology that could get us back on track of improving living standards. I, um, uh, I should mention that Charles wrote a great piece for Future Tense on Slate um, 
talking about the, the search for the vaccine, to spread the vaccine for smallpox in the uh, uh, <clears throat> two centuries ago and how the response was more global than some of the responses we're seeing today. Um, but Charles, do you have, as part of your sort of uh, formerly optimistic bent, a sense that, you know, from these great moments, dire moments, you know, we, 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 we can leapfrog, that it, that it kind of gets, it, it's what we need to create certain breakthroughs, whether it's on public health or other fronts? Sorry, yeah, so let me, let me be a bit more uh, characteristically optimistic. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm coming through, okay. Um, uh, nature was cutting me off as I was trying to be more uh, optimistic. Um, I think, as I sort of said at the beginning, that the chances are that we will deal with this pandemic not nearly as well as we should have done, but better than we've dealt with any previous pandemic. Um, uh, I think already you are seeing that. Uh, we've, in a, uh, China, Chinese scientists uh, figured out the RNA of this thing within you know, a few days. Uh, worldwide, we've got the World Health Organization organizing one of the first ever sort of global trials of, of five different um, treatments for uh, uh, COVID, in, including President Trump's favorite, the anti-malarial. Um, we're seeing sort of global co collaboration in, in uh, work on vaccines. I, I hope uh, that we will see, you know, within, within maybe even if just a few months uh, that we've got an effective vaccine. It's going to take a lot longer than that to roll it out to everybody, but um, that would be an important first step. So I do think there's hope uh, that uh, you know we'll see much more rapid than in the past technological advance. I mean, uh, after all, between the arrival of smallpox and the, the arrival of the first you know of the world's vaccine, the, the smallpox vaccine was a, a matter of thousands of years. If we manage to do it in, in a few months, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, and I think a sign of long-term global progress. On the subject of globalization, I saw the statistics earlier on today on US trade in various uh, pieces of, of, of PPE, of, of, of uh, personal protective equipment for um, medicine, uh, for, 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 for uh, protection against COVID. Um, if all you needed to deal with COVID was a uh, hand sanitizer, the United States would do fantastically in autarky. It produces a lot more hand sanitizer. Uh, it exports a lot more hand sanitizer than it imports. Um, pretty much when it comes to every other form of PPE, we import more than we export. So autarky would be a fairly disastrous short-term response for the United States. And I think even this administration is beginning to realize that. it. it the, the language at the sort of the start of the press conference will be, we're going to defund the WHO, we're going to put in uh, uh, trade barriers. And you know, by the end of the press conference or soon after, uh, that language is being rolled back. And I think that is, to be honest, point, you know, sort of uh, their bluff is being called. Uh, uh, we can't actually deal with this thing as individual countries. Um, the only way you can really treat an infection as a non-global issue is by completely cutting off globalization, by which I mean sort of going back to the point before Columbus uh, uh, traveled the ocean, right? I mean, uh, uh, you, you've got to cut off all all trade uh, and all movement of people, and nobody really uh, uh, expects or wants that to happen. Um, so we have to treat this as a, a global issue. And while the World Health Organization, nobody would call its record perfect, uh, I think it's done better this time than it did during the Ebola crisis of, of 2014. Um, it's done uh, a, a reasonable job, a better job uh, uh, than we might have expected in responding to this crisis. And the reason it hasn't done a better job still is it doesn't have enough power, it doesn't have enough money, it doesn't have enough responsibility, and it doesn't have enough respect. Two countries notably have been ignoring what the WHO said. China started by being uh, late on uh, reporting uh, the extent uh, of, of COVID-19 and, and what a serious public health issue it was. The United States, amongst many countries has been completely ignoring WHO advice on travel bans. Uh, it ignored early WHO um, advice on effective testing. China, the United States, a whole bunch of other countries have to give the World Health Organization the respect it deserves and the financing it needs to respond to future pandemics. 
But my hope is that rationality will win out and we'll realize that there isn't really much choice out of this pandemic apart from to increase the power of global organizations like the WHO. Mm -hmm. Optimistic realism. The old Charles is back. A ver, uh, Leon, anything <laughs> you want to add? Uh, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I, I think uh, Charles put it uh, very eloquently. Uh, I, I was, while I was listening to him, I was uh, thinking uh, uh, what comes afterwards, right? Um, uh, I, I've, been, I've been reading up on, uh, on, uh, on the Black Plague and how, how it began and what came afterwards and uh, how humanity uh, basically reclaimed the world after something that was far more horrific than what we're witnessing now, uh, including the discovery of America, the Renaissance. So I am, I am certainly an optimist, but I do think that uh, th th there is a fascinating question um, to be asked, what comes afterwards? What kind of world uh, is there waiting uh, five months from now or even a year from now uh, um, and and what kind of what kind of world will we have to uh, explain to our children? I'll, I'll, uh, Charles made me think of a moment that happened just just a year ago with one of my one of my kids. We were at the airport and he, and, and he saw me taking my my shoes off and putting them into the the machine. And he looked at me. Uh, he's very inquisitive and asked me, "Dad, please tell me why do you guys shoes off?" when we're going to go on an airplane. This is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And I told him, yes, it is ridiculous, but it, it, there's a reason for that. And so I told him the story of Richard Reed and how this guy wanted to blow up an airplane by a bomb that he was apparently, if I remember correctly, uh, he, he had some sort of device in one of his shoes. And from that point on, the world changed. And every time uh, an adult wants to get on an airplane, he has to take off his damn shoes and put them through the machine. So, <laughs> you know, and uh, that kind of change that, that, that happened after one particular episode and changed the, word, the way we travel forever uh, is just a, a very minor example of that we, I think we have to take uh, uh, and put into a, into a larger perspective when it comes to what, what we're dealing with now. What will, how will the urban landscape change? Uh, what industries will survive? And we, we have friends who uh, work in the re restaurant industry, uh, small, uh, medium, or large uh, uh, restaurateurs, um, uh, food industry professionals who are now really uh, wrestling with, uh, with, a, with a brutal situation. Uh, and that's just one industry. And that is what keeps me up at night, among other things, including my, my, my very inquisitive child. What kind of world comes after this? Which industry survived? What the landscape will be like? Will there, will there still be middle seats on airplanes, you know, or will there need to be social yeah. distancing? And I, or sporting events. I mean, there are so many things that, frankly, it's not, uh, we it, 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 it's important questions. Yeah. Uh, Leon, I wanted to, um, I'm, Reminded that a few years back, uh, you were incredibly generous with us at Future Tense. We did a, an event in Mexico City, um, and we, it was about whether technology is going to liberate us. So we had some title that was already somewhat provocative because they're, they're, the sort of rethinking about the role of technology in our lives, I felt like, was starting, you know, 10 years ago. That. 10 years ago, people had this very utopian view that all these new technologies were going to solve all our problems. And then... More recently, obviously, we've seen a climate where there's been more suspicion of big tech. Um, so we had that event in Mexico City that you you helped us do. Um, as a result of that, we've Arizona State University has had a, a series of convergence lab events in Mexico, and and you really were were part of. Uh, you never invited me back. Helping to launch those. Well, we we, we you know uh, <clears throat> we've gotten more modest. What's up? We, got, <laughs> we rolled out the big star for the first one. But on that but on that question of technology. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about globalization, and I feel like technology is another um, elephant in the room here when we talk about, you know, are things getting better or worse? Um, and obviously, like, if you're, if you're one of the big tech companies that was feeling pressure about antitrust or, or some of these debates in the political arena, maybe this crisis comes at a, at a, at a, at a I don't want to say a good time, but, you know, it, it might change the topic, right? And obviously, now we're more reliant on 
technologies like Zoom to have these events and, and the people are ordering from Amazon. And um, with all of the questions that's, that remain about privacy and so forth, um, but I want to ask you, this is a question for both of you, like what, where, where do we, if we've talked about globalization now, where do we fit in technology in terms of um, our uh, optimism going forward in terms of uh, being more connected in constructive ways and, and dealing with these problems? Or is there sort of a dystopian future around the corner that this is only going to accelerate and partly because of what technology is doing to our lives? Easy questions, all of these. <laughs> So um, I, I'll, I'll talk about a, a, a bit of that. I, I, one of the things that I'm really worried about, um, and, and Anna's uh, talked about it too, is that the impact of COVID so far is definitely a force for growing inequality. Um, the people who are most likely to get uh, COVID uh, are those who are providing the vital services, um, mainly people who are, you know, uh, the well paid, so levels for inequality. Uh, obviously, the people who are being thrown out of their jobs, uh, mostly uh, already at the lower end of the income scale. This is going to be a huge force for inequality, and the government response so far in this country. I mean, congratulations on the uh, uh, on the cash transfers. I think that's a great move, but it was way too small. Um, and so, without sort of further government effort, this is going to be a force for increased inequality. That is kind of what I feel about technology too going forward. Well, which is to say uh, what matters here is government. Now, the, basically more productivity I think is a good thing. So um, uh, I think that one of the big reasons that uh, Africa remains a lot poorer than Europe is the fact that if you look at agriculture in Africa, a lot more of it involves people threshing by hand than in, the United, in, in Europe or the United States. Um, machines increasing productivity leads to wealth but unless you have government uh, intervening doing its part uh, it can lead to greater inequality um, we have a bunch of tools that we really know work uh, to deal with this problem uh, one you may have heard of is called taxation uh, and <laughs> The fact that this is considered, you know, a complex and difficult issue, and ooh, what are we going to do about uh, inequality if, 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 if it turns out that technology is continues to be a force for inequality? We have the answers. We've had the answers since, you know, I don't know, 1800. When did they first introduce the income tax? Um, so I don't, I don't think this is rocket science. I think we, 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 we have policy responses uh, to deal with the economic downsides of these new technologies. Uh, uh, and I think broadly they are a force of positive good if you deal with those uh, economic downsides, at least uh, you know, in terms of uh, income and, and, and well-being. Um, but that does leave, leave aside the big and important and complex question of, well, what about privacy and you know, uh, uh, issues like that? Well, I mean, uh, I, I've, for for us uh, uh, media journalists, uh, Andres, uh, 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 technology is a godsend, right? I mean, what we what we have been seeing with technologies like uh, the one we're using now to communicate is is fascinating, and uh, it it brings us it brings us uh, together, and it for me as as a as a Univision uh, newscaster, it makes it possible for me to broadcast from my from my home. Uh, if, if I turn the computer around, you would see a couple of tripods and a couple of lights because um, I've been I've been broadcasting from from home. I'm completely, uh, uh, I mean, healthy. But uh, the, the the company decided that we we, we had to alternate my my co-anchor and myself. Uh, so of course the the I, th I think technology is a force for for good. Uh, what, uh, but in but in other ways, I, I do think that this particular crisis, this emergency, should work as a sort of a dress rehearsal or rehearsal for the two big crises that are that are coming up. I mean, in the near future, or are here uh, already. One of them, certainly, climate change, and and the other one is uh, artificial intelligence, uh, automation, AI. Right? I mean, the 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 enormous. Um, stimulus package that uh, the government uh, approved is uh, is very very close to to establishing some sort of universal basic basic income and uh, uh, once again the way governments react to this to this uh, to this emergency to this crisis 
uh, will, in a way, uh, set the path to the way they will react uh, to, to a crisis that is inescapable, because certainly the emergence of AI uh, is, is already here, and, and, and the, way, the way that Andrew Yang has become such a relevant figure, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. And um, it, it, is, it will be part of the conversation uh, in, the, in the coming years, and we will have to deal with it uh, one way or another um, very, very soon. One of the questions, um, you know, while we're on this topic, um, so from Mia asks, uh, Mia asks, we saw reporting that a great number of cases in Mexico were traced to some wealthy vacationers who brought the virus back after a ski <laughs> trip in Vail. Do you think we'll see the pandemic stoke class tensions in Mexico? Ah, well, you know, uh, yes, there were some people who went to Vail, uh, and uh, but that's 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 certainly not the way the the the, the, the pandemic began in, in Mexico. Um, I I hope not. I hope not. I I think that that goes back to. Uh, this, this previous part of the discussion about populist governments and how they are reacting, right? I mean, the president of Mexico in an incredibly controversial uh, statement said that this, and you will help me translate this perfectly well, Andres, because I can't think of the phrase. He said that the crisis fit him como anillo al dedo. No, to a T, maybe, would it, no? Like, like it, it really yeah. fit the moment. I don't know how you can translate that. It's, yeah. it's, it's a it, it comes fits like a, it fits like a glove, I guess. Would it be fits the, like a glove. It feels like literally, a glove. it's 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 it fits like a ring on their finger. Is but the idiomatic expression is like it fits like a glove. That's ex that's exactly right. And uh, what did he mean by that? What did he mean by that? Does that mean that he will use the crisis to steer this sort of uh, 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 cultural war, uh, class warfare that that he has used in the past? Uh, will he grow even more uh, uh, authoritarian, like it has happened already in Hungary, for example? Those are quest Those are open questions. Those are open questions. Um, just just this week, he uh, stepped up his uh, his confrontation with uh, with Mexican um, empresarios, the, the the entrepreneurial class in Mexico. So uh, I my my answer would be I hope not. But it's certainly, it's certainly a possibility. It depends in many ways, sadly, of this messianic figure that we have in charge over there and how he decides to approach the crisis. With his approval ratings falling, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, be surprised if he, if he tried to find some convenient scapegoats. Um, also someone related, David Sasaki. Hello, David asks, uh, what are the likely long-term effects of the pandemic on informal workers? Um, we've, I think you both have alluded to this a bit. And, and Charles, I'm just curious about whether you see, I mean, speaking of you know, taking advantage of, of crises to uh, affect change, like, are you optimistic that there might be some structural adjustments? In, yeah, and of course, it'll vary country to country, but um, to address some of these stru structural inequalities you've talked about, taxation, but the, you know, workers in the informal economy, you mentioned Uber drivers, but, you know, these could be one-off measures, or do you think we're going to see, like, real structural changes in how we treat certain people in our economy? So, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful to see change. I mean, and, and one of the places I think that's most important is in, in developing countries. Um, if you look at developing countries, not only uh, can they not afford um, the kind of uh, health responses that we take for granted in, in, in rich countries? Uh, there, are, there are reasons for sort of optimism about the overall scale of a health emergency in developing countries because younger populations seem to be better uh, when it comes to COVID, but there are also reasons for concern in that populations in places with bad um, air pollution, for example, do worse, and, and big cities in the developing world have pretty terrible air pollution. So just on the on the health side, there, there are reasons for optimism, there are reasons for fear. Pretty much there's no reason for optimism on the uh, economic side. The, the, the knock-on effects of, of uh, the global economic crisis that we're undergoing are going to be big in developing countries, and they're going to be big on, on, on health outcomes in developing countries, where small declines in GDP can have a big effect. 
on health outcomes. So in the short term, I really don't see much much reason for for optimism. But my hope is that one of the big responses that we see in developing countries to deal with the income effects is much more use of cash transfers, something that would have been impossible 15, 20 years ago. But you know, thanks to the expansion of mobile money, not least, is a lot more plausible now. A colleague was talking to, to, to a minister in Ghana about how many people uh, he thought that they could reach sort of directly with cash transfers in the short term. He was saying 80, 90 percent of the population. That's would have been unheard of uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So my hope is what we see is as a response to this uh, crisis, developing countries in particular, putting in place broad-based cash transfers for you know, when they're needed, and that's becoming something that they do more and more as a matter of course. Of course, in, in, in Latin America recently, including in, in, in Mexico and Brazil, we've seen things going the other way on, 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 on those grounds, that, that large cash transfer programs have been reduced. My, my hope is they come back again now. Yeah, Leon, do you have any anything to add on that? I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more with, with what Charles is saying. Uh, I, I mean, my, my concern is that uh, thinking of Latin America uh, and developing countries uh, at this particular moment, it really comes down to, to leadership, right? And uh, I, I think there are examples of remarkable leaders in, in Latin America, and this crisis has uh, uh, brought them to center stage. The president of Peru, for example, uh, has been remarkable in re reacting quickly to the crisis, uh, setting up quarantine, the country under lockdown, and pushing uh, um, ambitious uh, economic measures. I think the, the, the controversial president of El Salvador, we should be cautious uh, with, with his particular figure, Nayib Bukele, but I think that he has acted promptly and, and, and uh, with, um, with uh, uh, intelligence. But uh, once again, when, when, you, when you go back to Ar Argentina, has been another very good example of, uh, I, I think, in, in some ways, uh, that the, uh, President Fernandez has, has responded adequately. But when you go back to Mexico and Brazil, the stubbornness of both uh, uh, leaders has been just uh, completely astounding, even in the, the sort of example they set in those uh, crucial first weeks, Lopez Obrador insisting, just like Bolsonaro, in going out in public. Uh, he's, st he's still traveling. I think Lopez Obrador is still going to travel this, this weekend outside Mexico City, even though his own government is begging people to stay uh, in place, shelter in place. And he flies commercial, right? Famously, he, he, he flies commercial. He flies commercial and he, you know, he, 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 he goes to visit uh, uh, the, 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 the mothers, uh, the relatives of famous drug dealers. Uh, this sounds like a joke. It truly isn't. He, he did that with El Chapo's mother just recently. So when you have that kind of leadership, it's just mind blowing. Uh, and in this particular moment, you need serene, uh, smart, and even humble uh, leadership and uh, in Latin America, as, as we've seen so many times before, uh, the, 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 if you evaluate leaders, the result is pretty uneven, to say the least. Well, I, I am tempted to continue this for another few hours, but I'm mindful of everyone's time and the fact that we promised that we're going to keep these to an hour, but this has lived up to my indulgent expectations in terms of wanting to uh, spend some time with, with the two of you. I should mention before, before we say goodbye that uh, among the dozen or so Leon Krauses roaming the world, one of them uh, is, is um, uh, an important historical figure in connecting us at Future Tense more with Mexico. Um, we've talked a, a fair amount about Mexico in this conversation, but uh, Leon, uh, um, is part of the leadership of Letras Libres, a, a magazine that, that was founded uh, by your father, Enrique Krause. And Letras Libres has a, a publishing agreement with, with Slate and with Future Tense. And I was recently very fortunate to be able to edit uh, one of our Future Tense fiction stories with Juan Villoro, a, a, mm -hmm. a very well-known, uh, excellent Mexican author. And he wrote a, a, you know, a speculative piece of fiction that looks at some of the, um, you know, thinks about the future of globalization. There's, he actually drops a reference to COVID-19 in this story that is set in the sort of inter intermediate future. 
It's a mm -hmm. story in which a Mexican populist leader and China have conspired to turn vast swaths of Mexico into sort of a massive recycling plant for U.S. waste. Waste, you know, the, the trade, speaking of globalization, the trade and waste and recycling is, is a fascinating story. And China has obviously, uh, for, for, for quite a few years, was a, was a net importer and, and it was a great profit maximizer for them. And then, you know, as China develops, they're looking for third places to do that. And so there's this wonderful story that Juan has written that, that's very much focused in a Mexican village and looks at the sort of, uh, you know, uh, the local culture and the mind control technology that's involved. I don't want to give too much away, but we are having a conversation with Juan on one of these web chats next Wednesday as part of our activities of ASU programs in Mexico. So you can follow us at, at on Twitter at ASU underscore MX. And then the Future Tense programming, you can follow us at Future Tense now. And next week, Tuesday and Thursday, we're having some of these socials that I think we've teed up nicely today as well. On Tuesday at the same hour, uh, four o'clock East, we're doing one with the Boston Globe and their editorial page editor on thinking about climate change um, in the wake of coronavirus with Bina Venkataraman, who is their editorial page editor and a Future Tense fellow. And then Thursday's uh, Future Tense uh, Social Distancing Social will be on the question of will the coronavirus claim privacy among its victims? Um, wow. So really timely subjects. But today was so much fun. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you, Leon. And thank, thanks to everybody who was able to tune in and uh, please uh, keep coming and uh, hopefully we can, we can get through this period together. So thanks everybody. My Thanks, pleasure. Thanks, Ed. Stay Thank healthy. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.